that right. Okay. All right. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, we've just finished a series of messages. We were preaching and teaching through First John, and I thought, well, he has a couple more letters here after First John. Why don't we just finish that out because these next two are short, and uh, they are probably some of the last letters written in the New Testament, uh, written many, many years after the Gospels and after the other letters by Paul. Uh, by the time of John's writing of these letters, most of the other apostles were probably martyred by then. There might have been a few left alive. But uh, as I said before, when we uh, were talking about 1 John, when he wrote these, these letters, the church had been established. Uh, it had been maybe 60 or 70 years since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the day of Pentecost. So the church had become to be kind of institutionalized. The, the Apostle Paul and the other apostles had planted churches all through Europe and Asia, Asia Minor. So Christianity was spreading like wildfire. In fact, one of the, uh, in the book of Acts, one of, the, uh, one of the leaders of Rome said they t had turned the world upside down, li literally, by the preaching of the cross and the blood of Jesus. And of course, when God begins to move like that, you know that false teaching will begin to come in. And John's letter, his first and his second and third letter, deal with, in part, uh, how to deal with false teachers when they come, how to deal with uh, uh, people who, uh, in the, the third letter, people who try to take the authority when they don't have authority and so forth. It's really dealing with how to manage the body of Christ, how to manage the church, and how to deal with these kinds of issues. It's like a family matter, uh, how to deal with these issues that happen. In the second epistle of John, we're going to read just a little bit, and I have some slides up there. Uh, he begins by saying, The elder, unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Uh, the word truth is very big here in this letter. This letter was written to a woman. Uh, some people believe that when he talks about the elect lady, some people believe he was writing this letter to a woman named Electa. That's kind of silly. That's not true. Uh, others believe that he was using that term in reference to the church in general. But that doesn't make sense either. This letter is a personal letter that he wrote to a woman who uh, was saved and who had a family who was saved and very possibly a woman who had a, a church meeting in her home because in those days they didn't have church buildings. They met in homes. So it's very likely that she, uh, he wrote this letter to this, to this woman who he knew and loved very dearly. Uh, and it says in verse 2, For the truth's sake, which dwells in us and shall be with us forever, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. That word truth, he's used a lot of times in these first few verses. He says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. You think there would be something, you know, we keep reading truth, 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 truth. And, and this was not, well, this is the tact I wanted to take, but, boy, you know, I want to hear the truth. You know, if I go to a doctor, I want him to tell me the truth. If I go to a doctor and i got something growing inside of me that's going to kill me, I don't want him to tell me to go home and take two aspirin and lay down. I want to be up front with me. We don't like to hear that kind of news sometimes. But we need to hear. You know, John here is talking about truth. How much in, in just our lifetime in, in the last 20, 30, 40 years, since I've been saved for 30 years, however long it's, it's been, how much falseness has crept in to the body of Christ? How much have we sacrificed our love for truth? Okay. Now, listen to what he says. And now I beseech thee, lady... In verse 5, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is a, 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 like an echoing of his first letter. When we went through First John, it's always about loving one another. You know, we know that we love the brethren because we have the Lord inside of us. In verse 6, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Okay, now, verse 7. 
For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And we said this before when we were talking about 1 John, that what was happening in the, that early, that first century, at the very end of the first century, when the church had been established, sure enough, false teachers were coming, and false teachers were creeping into to the different churches, and they were preaching things that were contrary to the truth. They held themselves up as Christian uh, uh, teachers and prophets and so forth, and they even probably used a lot of the language and a lot of the lingo, and they might have even had some recommendations from other places. But there were those who were trying to undermine the truth, because this is the way Satan works. He doesn't come in, you know, we can pretty much tell if somebody comes in with something crazy, like, you know, like the Mormons, they're nuts. You know, when you, when you read what they believe, you know, we can pretty much, we don't have to, we don't have, to have a doctor of theology to figure out that stuff is wrong. And, and some of the other things, but these people were coming in as Christian leaders. And they were, they were, they were, they were proposing lies to the people and trying to convince them to seduce them away from their faith. It's interesting that the, the, the three books right before Revelation deal very, very heavily with false teaching and false teachers. Jesus said, in the last time, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. There will be many coming proclaiming to be teachers of, of Christianity, yet instead they teach falsehood. He says in verse 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Verse 9, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. The, the deceivers that were creeping into the churches in John's day, we remember we said they were called Gnostics. They either denied the physical reality of Jesus Christ, said he was just a spirit that kind of floated around, or they denied his deity, one or the other. The bottom line of what, how we can tell if something is true or not is what they say about Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Jesus. I want tonight to just talk a little bit about the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of Christ in 2 John. There's going to be a lot of scriptures. I, I spared my buddy Lou and put him up on the, so he doesn't have to hunt him up, okay? But we're going to talk about what is the doctrine of Christ? What's the, what's the bottom line? What's the foundation of what we need to believe? There's lots of congregations, lots of churches, Christian churches. What do we, what do we believe? What's, what's important? Okay? We're going to talk about a couple different areas that's important for us to know and understand as believers. You see, it, it behooves us as believers to understand doctrine and theology. We don't have to go into the depths of you know, things that people have studied for years and years and years and come up with all kinds of uh, theories and, and uh, presuppositions and uh, theses and all this other stuff. Listen, it's really very, it's all in the, in the scripture and it's really all pretty straightforward. What the word says about Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Christ. Very important, very important, okay? The first area we want to look at is his humanity. Because remember I said that the Gnostics of, of John's day denied the humanity of Jesus Christ. They denied that he was ever a human being. They believed that he was a spirit that kind of floated down here and maybe possessed a human being for a while, but they denied what, what we call, a big long word that you don't have to remember, the hypostatic union, meaning Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. Okay? Now, in John 1, in verse 14, and again, I, I usually like to look at things in context, but we have a lot of passages, so we'd be here a long time if we read everything. But you can look these up and read them in, in the context they come in. Uh, we know John chapter 1 begins by saying, uh, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Okay, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in, begin, it talks about everything that the Word done, and, and it's, it talks about how the Word is God. And it says in John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the Word was made, what? Flesh. The Word was made flesh. 
The humanity of Jesus Christ is essential to our faith. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, who wrote this letter that we're reading tonight, and who wrote that gospel, saw, had a first-hand experience with Jesus Christ. He knew Him in the flesh. He touched Him. He ate with Him. They traveled together. They, uh, he saw the miracles. He was there when He was hanging on the cross. He saw the blood shed, and the blood and water come out. He was there. So John knew that Jesus was as much a man as you or I. His humanity is without question. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men who? The man, Christ Jesus. There is one man who can mediate. It's not Mary. It's not saints. It's not the pastor. It's, there's one mediator. We pray for one another. Okay, we all pray for one another. But there's only one person seated at the right hand of God. And that's Jesus Christ. And when we pray, if I pray for you, you know who I pray to? I pray to Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We, we can approach the Father because He's seated at the right hand of God. Making intercession for us. So He is fully man. He's fully a human being. It's very important. That when somebody comes knocking on your door, the first thing you want to ask them is, what do you say? Who is Jesus? Okay, who is Jesus? Now, his humanity is established. Along with his humanity comes his deity. He is 100% man, and he's 100% God. And there's the, 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 the scripture from John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, as they come knocking on your door, they put a, a little, uh, an, an A in there. They'll say the word was a God. But there's nothing anywhere that says that that, that uh, word should be there. They try to relegate Jesus to being like a second-hand God. A second, you know, a created being. They think he's Michael the Archangel. He's a created being. But Jesus Christ was in the beginning... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All the way back in Genesis, in the beginning, the Son of God was there, Jesus Christ, in His deity. If you uh, would read Isaiah chapter 6, and you see Christ high and lifted up in His train filled the temple. Before He became a man, He was glorified in heaven above. His deity is established by God's Word. It's the doctrine of Christ. In John chapter 8, and verses 57, well, let's... Maybe we can turn there and read that a little bit. We can take some time and read a little bit. Turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 8. <clears throat> and uh, we want to start a little before that. In, in starting at verse... Um, Look at verse 52. Verse 52 in John chapter 8. The, Jesus was having a, a, a discourse, an exchange with the Pharisees. And it says in verse 52, Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that you have a devil. Abraham is dead. Well, what's he talking about? Well, let's, just, let's back up a little bit more. Uh, in verse... Uh, 48, uh, 49. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Okay. Then the Jews said unto him, Now we know that you have a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets uh, are, are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? They're saying, you know, what are you talking about? We'll never see death. All these, all our patriarchs, the prophets, the Abraham, Moses, all the rest, they die. And Jesus answered. He says, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. 
And if I should say, I know him not, I should be a liar like you. But I know him and keep his saying. Jesus never missed any words, I'll tell you. He told, he told it the way it was. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And they said unto him, you're not even 50 years old. You're telling me that Abraham saw you? How could he see you? He died hundreds of years ago. He's way back in the Old Testament. Jesus, you're not even 50 yet. And listen to what Jesus says, verse 58. See, anybody ever tells you that Jesus never claimed to be God, take him here. Because here's what he said. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Not I was. Not I used to be. I am. Now somebody might read that and say, well, maybe, maybe Jesus ought to take a, a course in grammar, okay? But here's what he's referring to. They, they knew what he was saying because it says right here that when he said that, they got ready to, to stone him to death. Why? Because he claimed to be the I Am. If you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, when, when Moses said, who shall I tell him uh, sent me here? And he says, I am that I am. Jesus claimed to be the I Am of Exodus chapter 3. He claimed to be the God that made a covenant with Abraham in the Old Testament. In his flesh, he was only 30-some 30, 30 years old. But he was eternal in his spirit. The, the eternal Son of God. Whenever you read in the Old Testament where, where God appears, I believe that's the pre-incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ when he appears to those uh, in the Old Testament, when he shows himself, okay? So his deity, he always was. Before Abraham was, he said, I am. In John chapter 20 and verse 28, when you remember after Jesus was resurrected, and, and he appeared to his disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. And when his disciples told Thomas, hey, we saw Jesus, he said, nah, you guys are nuts, I'm so you've probably seen a ghost or something. Or something. I ain't going to believe until I touch him. And we know that a week later, Jesus appeared to him and said, Hey, Thomas, check out the wounds on my hand. And what was Thomas' response? Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. Thomas knew who he was. He was God come in the flesh. The deity of Jesus Christ. Very important. No cult will accept the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. They either accept him as a good man and anoint a man who got some kind of spirit jumped on him somehow and, and he could go out and teach. That's what, that's what the, the witnesses teach and the Mormons teach. And, and there are some that they will never ex accept the fact that Jesus was actually a man, that he was just a spirit. The same Gnostic teachings that, that John had to combat, we combat today too. Same thing. Okay. Now, his attributes. Now, there's a lot of scriptures up there. We're not going to turn there. You might want to just take a look at some of these. But, you know, there are attributes of God that there are some attributes that he can communicate to us as, as human beings. We reflect the image of God. We're created in his image. And there's some attributes he can communicate to us. There's some that he can't communicate to us as human beings. You know, I can't be everywhere at once. Okay? I can only be one place at one time. I don't know everything, even though sometimes I might act like it. I don't. You know, nobody knows everything. You know, I'm sure not all powerful, right? But there are other a attributes God uh, imparts to us, morality and, and, and certain ways of thinking. But Jesus Christ, as the God-man, shared all his attributes. He was omniscient. He knows everything. He knows everything. And when he was on this, walking on this planet, he knew everything. He knew everything. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. Well, let's read a couple of them anyway. Turn to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. We're not in a big hurry tonight. We want to beat the freezing rain home, and we'll do that. Matthew chapter eight, uh, 28, the very last chapter in Matthew, the great commission that he gave to his disciples and gives to us. It says... We'll start in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, unto a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some 
doubt it. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, omnipotent. That's what omnipotent means. That means all power is His. He's an all-powerful God. There's not a force in the universe that even comes close to being who our Savior is. He says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And the great thing is, because he has all power, you know what? He delegates his authority to us. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The all-powerful God gives us the authority to call on his power to preach the gospel. He's omnipotent. Pastor Spencer used to say omnipotent. <laughs> but he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. God is everywhere. All the time. Now somebody might say, well, you know what? Jesus, when he was on this earth, he was just in one place at a time. He, he was a man like you or me. I can't be all over the earth at the same time. But look at Matthew chapter 18. I want you to read something with me. Back up a little bit. In verse 19, I've got to look at my own notes. Jesus said this, and he's talking about authority here, about binding on earth and loosing on earth. And he says that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, I'm there. I'm there. Again, he was a human being like me. He can only be in one place at a time when he walked this earth for 33 years. He never, he never quite went past uh, probably about a 200-mile radius would he travel. But we know that the resurrected Christ, he could, he could leave one place and be in another place like this. Because he is God. And God is everywhere and in everything and through everything. He shares that attribute with the Father, that He's omnipresent. He's immutable, Hebrews 13 and 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was the same before the foundation of the, of, of the earth. He's the same today. He will be the same for all of eternity. He, he never changes. God never changes. He's the only, I think, being that we could say that about, because every one of us, we change like the weather, okay? But Jesus never changes. He's the same. He can't fail, Jude verses 24 and 25. He's faithful, and he's righteous. If you read in Revelation 19, when he returns, he wears a vesture, and it says, faithful and true, the word of God. He shares all these attributes with the Father, because he is God in the flesh. Okay? Those are his attributes. Now, his works... We're the works of God. What Jesus did, he, he said over and over again, the works that I do are not mine, but they're the Father's. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, it says, For by Him, for by, by who? By Christ. By Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's, that's God talk. That's God talk. Paul puts the impetus for creation on Christ, as John did in his gospel. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is over everything. He created everything. Those are the works of God that Christ did. Forgiveness. In Mark chapter 2, and let me turn there because it's kind of small. Mark chapter 2. It's just, again, it's a story we're all uh, familiar with. Starting at verse... Uh, <coughs> 
Let's, let's start with verse, uh, let's just start at the beginning of the chapter, verse 1. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Verse 2. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached. It was standing room only in that place. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Four guys came carrying their buddy on a stretcher. And when they could not come in nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. They climbed up on a roof, made a hole, and dropped him down. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, listen to what he says, Sons, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, you know, that's, that's a pretty heavy thing to say, especially back in those days. Now, don't you know that there were some religious folks there, and they got highly offended. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Only God. Only God can forgive sins. You know, we can forgive one another. If you do something wrong to me, I can forgive you and say, okay, I forgive you. But when it comes to entering into heaven, in entering into God's presence, I can't forgive you for God, okay? I can't make you right in God's eyes. You have to do that with him for yourself through the blood of Jesus Christ. But Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. And they said, wait a minute. Man, only God can forgive sins. Who's this guy? And immediately when Jesus perceived the om omniscient who knows everything, when he perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within, within themselves, he said, why reason you these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and he left. And everybody looked on him and said, Wow, who's this guy who can forgive sins? You see, he does the works of the Father. You know, these, and these scriptures I'm bringing tonight, they're not all inclusive. There's so many more that you could find, but his purpose. Why did Jesus come here? Well, some say he was a great teacher. He came here to be a good teacher. Came here to be a prophet. Came here to start a new religion. Came here to start a church. Okay? But that's not why he came. Look at Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Jesus said this. Here's why I came. For the Son of Man has come to what? Seek and save that which was lost. He didn't come to start a religious movement. He didn't come to start a church. He didn't come to build big cathedrals and build big buildings and, you know, have, have uh, popes and bishops and deacons. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't come here to exalt anybody on this earth. He came to seek and save that which is lost. Sometimes I think we got it all mixed up. Sometimes I think people think this church thing is about, you know, people being lifted up and empowered. And well, That's not why Jesus came. He came to save us from our sin. He came to save us from a Christless hell. That was his purpose. From the beginning, from before the beginning of the foundations of the earth, that was the purpose of Jesus Christ. Thank God that he came to save the lost. Because I was lost. I don't know about you. If you don't think you was ever lost, then you're in trouble. I was lost. I had to confess my sins. I had to come to a God who I knew I needed to save me from my sins. I was lost. And he came to save me. The Apostle Paul said, he came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Well, I could say that about me too. Maybe Paul and I would have an argument about that. Who's worse? Okay. But he came to save sinners, all right? In 1 Timothy chapter 1. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. The Apostle Paul writes, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. That's why he came. He didn't come here to start the Church of God or the Catholic Church or you know, a movement or Lutherans or Protestants. He came here to save the lost. The church has lost its vision. The, the body, the, what calls itself the body of Christ, it's lost its purpose. 
We think we're here to build like, you know, great buildings and build, you know, uh, monuments and movements and, and have, uh, have uh, uh, schools and colleges. and uh, that's, uh, that's all right if you want to have a college, okay. But that's not, why, that's not why he came here to establish the church. He came here to save the lost. I'm not putting those things down. You know, one time Pastor Spencer preached a message about deception in the church. <laughs> he did not come here so we could build a basketball court. He didn't come here so we could build a gymnasium. He didn't come here so we could have a fun center. <laughs> okay. I think that's what folks think the church ought to be. It ought to be like, you know, let's, let's go have fun. I'd like to have fun in church too. But why are we here? So that people can get saved. So we can be equipped. So that we can go seek and save the lost. That's why he came. That's why he came. Okay. Just a couple more things. His purpose in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. We need to turn to this one. And we're going to close. We're going to close with this one. Before we go read the rest of 2 John. Philippians chapter 2. And I've, I've told people, I've, I've, I'll preach on this passage probably 10 times a year. And the reason is because it's, it's so important that you understand what this passage says. It really covers all the bases that we've talked about tonight. It covers like everything we've said tonight. Listen to what he says. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? Who being in the form of God, or the likeness of God, Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now this is the King James. A newer version will have something a little different. And I'll explain that. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. So here's what it's saying. That Jesus was, was God before his incarnation. He was high and lifted up in this train filled the temple, Isaiah chapter 6. That's where he was. He was in glory from all of eternity. He was involved in the creation of everything. He was the eternal Son of God, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Eternally uh, coexistent, co equal, co powerful. And there came a time when he decided to step into time. He was willing to relinquish his position with the Father. He never stopped being God. He never stopped being God. He was completely God and completely man. But he was willing to relinquish that position of glory and power. If you read Isaiah chapter 6, it says that the, the angels were shouting, Holy, holy, holy. And there was smoke and fire and noise and just uh, glory. And that's where Jesus was. He left all that to be born in the place where they keep animals. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was willing to, to, to release his grasp. And he allowed himself, his image, to be changed from the glory of God to the likeness of man, like you or me. The, the, the implication is, if you pour water from a pitcher, it's still water, but it takes a different shape. He was completely God, but he condescended to be to take on one of these bodies. And why did he do it? You see, the cults don't like, they, they've, they've, they've done all kinds of, all kinds of uh, violence to this passage. Because this presents Jesus Christ as completely God and completely man. And this is why he came. He says, in verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he what? Humbled himself, the creator of everything, the all-powerful, omniscient, omnipotent God, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He came here for one purpose, to die for sinners. Anybody? Listen, the bottom line, the doctrine of Christ is that God sent His eternal Son, the second member of the Godhead, 
And he willingly came here and took on a body like this and was completely God and completely man and humbled himself and was willing to be the sacrifice, the atonement, the covering for our sin. He came to seek and save the lost. And, and nobody's sin is any better than anybody else or anybody's, any worse than anybody else. Sin is sin and sin will keep you from God. It will send you right to hell. But Jesus Christ made a way. He goes on and he says, Wherefore, because he humbled himself and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every human being that ever lived on the face of this planet from Adam until now will bow their knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. If they don't do it in this life, they're going to do it in what is called the second death, the great white throne judgment. They'll have no alternative they won't be able to say anything else. But Jesus Christ is Lord. I thank God through His mercy, I've done it here. I've done it before I cross over into that eternity. Because if they wait till then, it's going to be too late. Now, today is the day of salvation. And this is why Jesus came. And this is why we have the church. And this is what John was telling the elect lady that he wrote to. Turn to 2 John just one more time and we're going to just finish out and we're going to close. I'm not keeping you too long tonight. He says, 2 John in chapter 9, he says this, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. I don't care what they look like I don't care what they sound like. I don't care how they dress. I don't care if they have miracles floating around them. I don't care if they power. If they deny the doctrine of Christ that we talked about here, his deity, his humanity, his, his works, why he came. If they deny that he is the only way, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father but by me. If they deny that, I don't care what accompanies them. They are not from God. They're not from God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. Now, look at verse 10. If there come any unto you, God help us, and bring not this doctrine, don't let them in. Don't let them in. Receive him not into your house. Don't say, God bless you. You know, when they come knocking on my door, I go out on the porch. <laughs> I hate, I, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't like talking to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. I don't. I, I really, you know. But when they come to my house, I go out on the front porch. I don't invite them in and say, hey, have a seat. Have a, you want a coffee? I'll get you a coffee. No. I go out and talk to them on the front porch. And I try not to waste any time or miss any words with them. I try to lovingly tell them the truth. That they believe the lie. But I don't, and when they walk away, I don't say, God bless you. No. He says, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine. And by the way, I don't let them in on my TV set either. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> he says, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. Verse 11. For he that bids him God speed is a partaker. Now, if I'm reading this right, and I say, God bless you, I'm like, I'm like sending them off with God's blessing. I'm partaker. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. Isn't that what it says? 
Now, it doesn't say I'm supposed to hate him. It doesn't say I'm supposed to throw a brick at him, okay? I'm, I'm, we're supposed to witness to him, tell him the truth. Try to lead him to the Lord. But they ain't coming to my house. And I ain't going to say God bless you. Because John says right here. He says, in closing his short letter, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of the elect, sister, greet thee. Amen. Amen. He closes his letter. This very brief letter that John wrote, probably to answer a question. This woman probably said, hey, I got these people coming to my house, and they're saying this and that and everything else. And John said, hey, I want to tell you something. Very important. How many of you have ever been accosted by a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon? I ain't seen the Mormons in a while. I, normally we see them walking in the neighborhood. I haven't seen them in a while. I don't know if, have they been around? Yeah, white shirts and name tags, yeah. yeah. White, white shirts and name tags, yeah. Okay. I, 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 I haven't seen them in a while, but, you know, we're supposed to pray for them. We're, try to, we're supposed to try to lead them to the Lord. But if you've ever encountered these people, you know what? If you're not really good in your word, don't talk to them. If you don't really know God's word, just say, no thanks. Sorry. They'll try to engage you. You know, if you, if you, if you don't know, because you know what? They'll, they'll have your head spin if you don't know what the word says. Now, I found out personally, and I'm not saying this for my own, you know, uh, when they come, I, you know, I don't have that hard a time with them. Except I, I gotta, I gotta watch myself. I don't start yelling. <laughs> I gotta make sure I don't start yelling. But, but you know, really, when you start listening to their arguments and they're and they're so they're so flimsy. If you know God's word, but if you don't know God's word, man, they'll have, they'll have you gone back in church history and everything else. Blah 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 blah. You know. Pray for them. If you, if you know the word, you can engage them. Don't let them in your house. <laughs> don't let them in. Don't get them coffee. Mormons won't drink coffee anyway. Don't believe him. But tell the truth. And don't let them in on your TV set either. Because there's lots of them. Man, there's lots of them. There are a lot. Listen. There's a lot of deceivers. You all know that. I don't know if I should even talk about this. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. I don't know if I how, many, how many know one of the leading uh, charismatic evangelists was recently stopped DUI? No. One, one, one Jimmy. Jimmy's been to the cross. He's washing the blood. I think Jimmy's doing all right. It wasn't Jimmy. It was, it was, it, he, he was stopped. DUI. No. I'm not going to add. Don't try to guess. He'd been. Okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. People watch him, and, and, and he'll, they'll have him come on to raise money. He's a good money raiser. And they'll have him. But you know what? And, and you know, anybody can make a mistake. Hey, he's human. I pray for him. Pray for his, you know, forget, pray he gets his life together. But how is it? That people get to the place of being a nationally known, worldwide known leader in the church and they get picked up for DUI. Give me a break. Give me a break. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Now, okay, and people, people will welcome him into their home. And again, I'm not condemning Hey, I'll pray for him. I'll pray for, his, I'll pray for forgiveness and, and cleansing and healing. Okay, you understand? I'm not, I'm not trying to put him down or, or nail. I'm not trying to vilify him. But what is, what is with the church that we'll let these people in our homes via TV that we know ain't right? And we still watch them. And sometimes even write the checkout and send it in. You know, Okay. I've now I've got my little rant done. Okay. Be, what did John say in his first letter? Try the spirits. Test the spirits. Make sure they're talking about the right Jesus. And make sure they got the right spirit. That's how we can tell. 
And that's how we got it to. Amen.